And let's start at the top. The question that everybody's probably wondering is Eli Mitchell, 11% owned now. How much do we bid on this guy? Mostert is done for the year, which sends the price up even further than what we would have been imagining yesterday. What amount is too much? Well, let's look at the positive. 19 for 104, a TD, looked like a seamless fit was playing ahead of Trey Sermon because he outplayed him in camp. Thanks for that report, beat writers. No idea where that was the other day. But Brent Cohen did come on our podcast over the summer. 49ers beat and said, as good as Sermon's looking, Mitchell is looking even better. This is a guy that had 4.35 speed at his pro day. You know they want that speed element regardless of who else is in there. So he's going to have a role in this Shanahan backfield no matter what. Uh, the thing is, is now how much is he going to be worth? One end could be a league winner. If this guy ends up knocking down a roll for 14 games of the season, 15, 16, all year becomes the starter, he would be the next Steve Slayton, the next Arian Foster. I mean, anybody that gets consistent volume in a Shanahan scheme is going to eat. The question, though, becomes is, is he actually going to get that volume? Shanahan already came out and said it's a game-by-game -game basis just two days ago after the game. Uh, it does seem like Mitchell should be the one getting the first crack. But Sermon, was it punitive? Did he miss like curfew? Did he? I, I don't know. I don't know what it was. Was he really that, just that outplayed? But either way, he's going to be back on the field now with Mostert out for the year. It, it could be hasty getting all the carries next week. So for me, you know, you're going to have to pay 40% to 50% of your, your fab budget. You're going to have to burn your number one waiver wire priority to get this guy. If you are desperate, let's say Mostert was your RB2 and then it's trash behind him, go for it. Dive, you know, head first. Let's go. Let's see how this pans out because it could be that league winner. Otherwise, if I'm at a pretty good roster, I don't feel the need to go and blow half my load to go get this guy. I mean, somebody might even bid 100%. You guys know your leagues. And as you can see uh, here, the, the, percent, the percentage next to the name is going to be their percent rostered in leagues. And then the fab I will put after that. So I don't think he's personally worth as much as he's going to go through. I, I think somebody's going to blow too much in every single league. He, that could come back. You could clip this and, and he could have 1,500 yards by the end of the season if he's the starter in every game. But let's remember this was against the Lions. This was a, a one-time thing without many available backs around him. Uh, so ultimately, I'm passing at the expensive, exorbitant price, even though I can recognize the upside. I'm not going to be paying as much as he's likely to go for. I'll throw in some bids. I'd recommend you about 25%. You know, I, I'd like to see what happens there, but I personally won't be going in at that crazy 40% number. It's likely going to take to get him. Moving forward, I'm just going to kind of go in order. Uh, some years I do positions. This year I figured I'm just going to go you know, top 15, and you guys can kind of go back and sift through depending on your team needs. Of course, readjust as needed, but I think Cole Beasley has to be there towards the top of the list. Now, before we dive into him, if you guys don't mind tossing a like, a thumbs up, getting us out to more people would be so greatly appreciated. Of course, I'm going to get to all your questions as we go, uh, but it would mean the world if you don't mind tossing a like on this. Let's get into Cole Beasley, though. 45% on, so not a guarantee to be out there in most competitive leagues, but 13 targets are 13 targets. He is, again, that clear-cut third down, move the chains. When Josh Allen needs his safety valve, Cole Beasley is the first guy he's looking to, maybe even ahead of Stephon Diggs in those third and short situations. So Beasley, eight catches, 60 yards, not a wild stat line, not anything incredible or amazing that you're going to go right home to, but it still was a solid steady. And I think that's kind of, compared to a lot of options on this week's waiver wire, that's going to be something that's pretty steady all year. So as like a wide receiver three or potential flex with like a high floor, pretty low ceiling. But the guy did have multiple 25 to 30 point days last year. So there is still a ceiling. He can still find the end zone. Sanders was involved as well, though. So I think his ceiling is a little capped compared to last year. Still a solid, steady wide receiver three as their clear cut slot guy. That's a team that's throwing it 75% of the time, uh, and sometimes even 80, given that those game scripts. Uh, so I love Cole Beasley as my number one waiver receiver, should he be out there for you. James White, again, these names aren't that sexy to start the list, but I'm looking at steady, dependable production. That's really hard to find in the waivers come the next couple of weeks. I think James White is 100% one of those. We saw a nice vintage game, six receptions, seven targets, 49 yards, four carries for 12 yards. Uh, it, it was, you know, 18.4% target share. And encouragingly, the Patriots also ran 75 plays. In week one, that was the eighth most in the league for a team that most thought was going to be sluggish, slow, try to control that clock. And they did. They ran the ball 
quite often, but that's the other benefit with White right now is both their starting running backs. First, Damian Harris. Well, first, Ramon Shearer something. But also at the top of the depth chart, Damian Harris did fumble as well. Both of them are reportedly in the Belichick doghouse. We've seen this play out. We've seen Jonas Gray run for like 204 touchdowns and then get into the doghouse and never sniff a down for the Pats again. I don't think that's what happens with Harris. Certainly don't think it happens with Ramondre either long term, but they're in the doghouse. The report was Harris is in the doghouse, came out on Monday. They're going to probably pepper James White. Now, they might also work in, and that's why I put in stash J.J. Taylor. No one's talking about this guy. 1% owned, looked incredible, electric, like Deion Lewis reincarnated this preseason with J.J. Taylor. If you're looking for an upside stash that no one's going to put any money on, go for him. But if you want some immediate usability, we already know James White is going to lock down that pass-catching role with, again, around 18 to 20% target share. What if... You know, he becomes that just a couple seasons ago. You guys, if you can remember when Sony Michelle got her as a rookie, James White was the top seven fantasy football back because he became like a de facto workhorse. It's within his range of outcomes and the floor already is pretty damn high. So in terms of usable running backs beyond just Elijah Mitchell, I really think James White has a ton of upside in a solid floor at only 33% owned. I'd be bidding a nice 15% or so fab to go and get him. Now, the other guys that I love, a little more upside than, say, Cole Beasley, that's Christian Kirk and Rondell Moore. And honestly, I don't know which one I love more. I'd be willing to spend 15% or more of my fab to get these guys if I needed a receiver badly and they were out there. Uh, Kirk was the one that had the bigger stat line there, 70 yards, two touchdowns, five receptions on five targets. But Moore was also really encouraging. Also saw five targets on far fewer routes, only 14 routes, but got peppered on five of those. Nearly 30, uh, over 30% usage rate right there on the, th- the place he was in there. Now, of course, gross-ass A.J. Green saw 32 routes, six targets, more than either of these guys but he did just disgusting, Not, nothing with it, didn't look anything special. And, and whereas Larry Fitz was like always in that lineup, no matter what, as a Cards legend, I think A.J. Green could immediately get superseded by Rondale Moore. Christian Kirk seems pretty damn secure in that slot role, 95.7% of the snaps in the slot. And uh, that's a role that's, you know, yeah, oh, he's a pigeonhole in the slot, now he's not going to do much. He ran almost everything from the boundary last year. I think that's a good thing for him. A nice, steady, and we saw what he did getting vertical, averaged the deepest routes, even though he was soaking in slot targets, 12-yard depth of target for him. I love to see that, uh, them going over the top there. And a great article, PFF tweets out, you know, pace, stats, all that. Uh, who uh, Dwayne McFarland writes this one. And I'm a huge fan of Dwayne McFarland's uh, work over there at PFF. And he talked a lot about the usage rate, how it it should be steady given how high they use their three wide receiver sets here. Um, So again, 96% of slot routes, just 16% rate last year, but they run three or four wide receiver sets 70% of the time. Uh, So it's not a bad thing that he's pitching holding the slot. It's clear that he's thriving in that area. So I love Christian Kirk. I probably prefer him just slightly to more, even though more has a little more juice, that rookie type of upside you always love to see, but both those guys, I mean, this offense is going to be unstoppable. We saw what Kyler can do in San, and I don't think that's just you know, the Titans. Yeah, they're bad. I think it's going to happen on a week to week basis. So go all in on those cards. If you're wide receiver needy, get yourself an exciting piece of the most exciting offense beyond maybe only the chiefs. If you're quarterback needy, there's nothing you could do better than Jameis Winston, 44% on. Now we'll go a couple guys later in case Jameis isn't there. 44%. You know, there's a decent chance he might be gone, but five touchdowns. Uh, what a touchdown rate this guy had. What was it, 14 passes attempted, like five of them going for touchdowns? Incredible. So only 150 yards, but still put up 30-something uh, fantasy points, depending on your scoring. So hyper-efficient. More importantly, zero turnovers. And this was one of the better pass defenses last year, the Green Bay, Char- uh, Green Bay Packers. So uh, he had two attempts, 20-plus yards deep, um, and, and they kind of really reined him in. And that's okay. Like he clearly did his damage so efficiently. He was three of five uh, with two touchdowns under duress, under pressure, showing a little more maturity. That's what we need to see. Maybe LASIK Jameis, maybe, um, you know, with the coaching from Sean Payton. There's never, it doesn't matter what weapons he has. And that's what another takeaway from Jameis's big performance. Deontay Harris, long touchdown. Jawan Johnson, two touchdowns. 
Uh, Callaway didn't even do anything, and Jameis still had this monster day. So I really liked what I saw from Jameis. I think there's going to be days, yeah, the touchdowns will come down, but the, you'll, the, that'd be matched with 300 passing yards when the script isn't so dominating. Again, what a shocker this week. But loved what I saw from Jameis just from a maturity standpoint, from a step forward standpoint, and from just an overall play calling and, and just efficiency of the Sean Payton offense looked again to be one of those best offenses in the league, even with no weapons. That's Sean Payton for you, folks. And you got to really, uh, if you need a quarterback, Jameis, top 12, rest of the year on my rest of the season big board. What is up, you fantasy wolf? Thanks so much for tuning in. If you haven't already, share your thoughts in the comments, check out some more videos, and join the newest Wolfpack by subscribing below.